Welcome to Pharmacology Mini Number Two, where we'll be talking about medication administration. To start off, there's many different routes of administration that we're going to break down and talk about. You can have an oral medication as well as sublingual and buccal, topical, which can be through transdermal, ophthalmic, eardrops, through the nose, through the rectum or the vagina, inhalation through either a meter dose inhaler or a dry powder inhaler, and we'll also talk about nebulizers. Parentally, we have the intradermal, subcutaneous, and intramuscular injections, as well as intravenous medications and epidural. Lastly, we can administer medications through the nasogastric or gastrostomy tube. Oral medications are tablets, capsules, liquids, suspensions, elixirs, or lozenges that are taken through the mouth. As you can see in the picture, these are examples of some different ones. So we have tablets in the first two pictures, as well as a capsule in the third picture. If we have an oral medication that needs to be cut in half, we can only cut it in half if it's scored. So you can see in the first picture how there's a line down the middle of the medication. That's where we would cut it in half. The middle picture, however, has no score, so we would not be able to cut that one in half. And the reason for that is because when there is a score, the medication is produced in a way that you know that it's equal effectiveness of the active ingredient on both sides. Without the score, we don't have that reliability, and that's why we wouldn't cut a medication without a score. The advantages to oral medications are that they're safe and expensive and easy and convenient to use. The disadvantages is that it has variable absorption, especially with first pass metabolism. If a medication has high first pass metabolism, they'll often be coated with enteric coating or created in an extended release form. What that means is that the coating is able to withstand the gastric juices so that it can break down at the site where the medication's intended to rather than in the stomach. Other disadvantages is that it requires ability to take. If someone can't take the medication, it may be difficult for them to get the benefit of that. And that could be related to the patient being NPO, having dysphagia and being unable to swallow it, or not being able to tolerate it once they swallow. And that could be through vomiting it up um, in other ways. Sometimes we may need to crush oral medications and mix them in applesauce or liquids so that the patient can take them more easily. The one thing that you do need to know when a medication is crushed is if it has the ability to be crushed. We would never want to crush any enteric or extended release capsules. Nursing considerations with oral medications is to look at the interactions of the different medications if they're taking more than one. We already talked about the scoring and crushing and the ability to take. Also, if it's a sublingual, you want to make sure that the medication's under the tongue, whereas buccal, you want it in the side of the cheek. We would want to know also if the medication be, should be taken with or without food. Some medications have reduced effectiveness when mixed with food, and other medications may benefit from being taken with food because it can reduce nausea and vomiting from that. The topical medications are those that go on top of the skin. The different types are transdermal, like the transdermal patch that you can see in the bottom right picture. It can be done through the eye, and through the eye, it could either be eye drops or an eye ointment, through the nose, through the ear, rectally or vaginally. The advantages of topical medications is that they often have quick absorption, but the disadvantages is that they can be uncomfortable to both administer and have. Nursing considerations when using topical medications is the amount of irritation it's causing, the skin integrity, because we would never want to administer the medication if skin integrity is impaired, the positioning needed for the patient. So for example, when a patient is getting eardrops, the position that they need to be in may differ based on if they're a child or an adult. Application of the topical medication is important to know as well. Any PPE that would be needed. So if you're doing a rectal suppository, obviously you would need gloves. A lot of transdermal patches, you would also need gloves for so that the medication doesn't touch your skin and cause effect. We would also wanna use um, gloves if we're doing anything with <clears throat> the eyes or the nose. Also, you would want to consider the patient's strength. 
we always want to encourage the patients to be as independent as possible. And so we want to encourage them to administer these medications on their own with our supervision if they're able to. So for example, if they're doing a nasal spray, do they have the hand strength to actually activate the medication so that they're getting the medication? Then we have inhalation. For inhalers, we have the meter dose inhaler, and this is a pre-mixed inhaler. In order to administer this, you would remove the cap, shake the inhaler, close your mouth on the mouthpiece, take a deep breath and exhale, then tilt your head back, press the inhaler down, and inhale a slow, deep breath over three to five seconds. You would then wanna hold your breath for 10 seconds and remove the inhaler. When you're administering a meter dose inhaler, you wanna direct it towards the back of the throat when administering. A lot of times this is difficult for people and very little of the spray actually reaches the back of the throat. So they've just designed what's called a spacer where you can connect the inhaler to the spacer, spray the medication in and then inhale through the mouthpiece of the spacer. And this helps to get more of the medication to the back of the throat. And you can see a picture of both the spacer and the meter dose inhaler to the left. A dry powdered inhaler is one that is not pre-mixed. So you do not shake it and you have to prepare the medication. There's different ways that you can prepare it and you can see in the picture, there's different structures for it. The inhaler on the far right is just one where you prepare it by moving the light purple to the other side and that mixes the medication and prepares it. The one in the middle is one where you actually take a um, pill and you put it inside the inhaler and then you press that blue button to crush it and then that prepares the medication. So in order to administer a DPI or a dry powdered inhaler, you would prepare the medication, place the mouth over the mouthpiece, take a slow deep inhale of five to 10 seconds, remove the inhaler, and then you do wanna rinse your mouth when using a dry powdered inhaler. And the reason for this is because that dry powder can get stuck in the back of the throat and it can cause growth of bacteria and individuals can often develop thrush. So by rinsing the mouth, we're ensuring that they don't develop thrush. Nursing considerations and education when using inhalers is that if they have more than one inhaler, we may need to wait a required amount of time in between administration. We can often use an inhaler to enhance the effectiveness of other medications. We wanna monitor for symptoms of thrush. And an inhaler can be used daily for long-term prevention, or it can be a rescue inhaler, which is used in the moment that the patient needs it. A nebulizer, on the other hand, is a misted medication rather than an inhaled chemical that provides treatment. It is quicker delivery, and the process for administering a nebulizer is to do hand hygiene, to set up the device, so that would be connecting the tubing to the medication chamber to the mouthpiece, and you can see an example of what all that looks like to the right. Then you wanna connect it to oxygen. In order for a nebulizer to be effective, we wanna place the oxygen at six liters. Then we would put the medication in the little medication chamber, place the mouth on the mouthpiece, and they should breathe through their mouth until all the medication is um, misted from the medication canister. And that typically takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Nursing considerations for nebulizers is to make sure that you're listening to their lung sounds before and after administering a nebulized treatment. As far as parental medications go, these are going to be ones that are administered into the body through needles or catheters. The different needles that we use are gonna be dependent on different things. So when we talk about gauge, the larger the number, the smaller the size. So certain medications require an 18 gauge or a 20 gauge, for example, administering blood. Other medications or injections that may be more beneficial to use a smaller gauge, um, or I'm sorry, a larger gauge, so a smaller needle so that it doesn't cause as much trauma. Then we need to know the different types of needles. A blunt tip and a filter needle are used to draw up medications. And that's the, going to be the red and the purple that's to the left. The filter needle has a filter within it so that it filters out any particles that we don't want inserted into the um, medication or the body. And an example of when you would use a filter needle is if you're drawing up a medication from an ampule. 
Then we have our different catheters. Typically, the catheters are used for IVs, and there's two ways of administering it. You can use it through a butterfly clip or a regular catheter. And then we have our injection needles, and those are going to be the needles that are specifically designed to be injections. There's a lot of different kinds of injection needles, and based on where you practice, we'll determine what types you have. Lastly, every injection needle has a safety. And what this means is it's a lock that covers up the needle after administration to reduce the risk of us poking ourselves. You can see in the picture to the right that there's different types of safeties. Some clip into place and some slide. Then we have to think about the syringes. There's different sizes of syringes that we can use. Typically for um, injections, it'll be a smaller syringe. For IV administration, it may be larger. Um, mostly we see between half an ml to 10 ml syringe, but sometimes you will see larger than that as well. A TB syringe is one that has often like a gray or blue cap and it's measured in mls. It's usually half an ml to one ml in size and it has a small needle attached to it. An insulin syringe always has an orange cap and it's measured in units. So when you're administering insulin, you have to make sure that the unit strength of the needle matches the unit strength of the insulin. With insulin, we can also have an insulin pen, which you can see to the right. And this is a pen where you attach a needle to it and then you prime the needle and administer the number of units the patient needs. As far as connections go, each syringe is able to connect to different things. Um, some needles are non-removable when attached to the syringe, like your insulin or your TB needle needles, whereas others are removable and have a lure lock. Um, so the lure lock, you can see a picture of it down below, but this allows us to attach different needles to the syringe, or you can attach the syringe to IV tubing. So the different types of parental medications are intradermal. This goes um, in between the epidermis and the dermis. It uses a liquid size of 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 ml, so it's a very small amount of fluid. You would use a syringe that's 1 ml or smaller in a needle size of 26 to 27 gauge. And how you administer it is you find a site either on the forearm or the scalpula that's lightly pigmented and hairless. You would obviously clean it with an alcohol swab and then you want to get the needle into that space between the epidermis and the dermis, which is about a 10 to 15 degree angle with the bevel up. So the bevel is where the hole is in the syringe. And then you inject the medications. If you do it correctly, you should see a little bubble on the skin, which is called a bleb. Intradermal medications are often used for TB testing and allergy testing. Subcutaneous tissues go into the subcutaneous tissue, or I'm sorry, the subcutaneous injections go into the subcutaneous tissue. The liquid size that is injected into the subcutaneous tissue has to be less than 1.5 mLs, and typically we'll use a 1 mL syringe for that. The needle size would be 3 eighths to 5 eighths of an inch long and have a gauge of 25 to 31. The administration sites is anywhere where we have subcutaneous tissue. So you can see in the diagram, this includes um, the ab abdomen, the thighs, back of the arms, the lower back, and anywhere where there's fatty tissue on the individual. For the angle, we would do a 45 to 90 degrees. 45 degrees are going to be our patients that are a little bit thinner, whereas 90 degrees are going to be our patients that have more prominent subcutaneous tissue. When administering a subcutaneous injection, we do want to make sure that we are pinching the skin. Different types of subcutaneous tissue examples um, or injection examples are things like insulin and use of blood thinners like heparin or Lovenox. Then we have our intramusculars. The benefit to using an intramuscular injection, which is an injection that goes into the muscle, is that we can use more irritating medications because it goes directly into the muscle. It won't irritate the skin like a subcutaneous will. Um, also, we can administer solutions that are mixed with oils or aqueous suspensions, and we can provide larger amounts of medication. So in an intramuscular injection, we can administer one to three mLs. The syringe size that we would use would be between one and five mLs. The needle size 
would be one to one and a half inches long. And that would be determined on how much fatty tissue the individual has, how big the muscles are, because we wanna make sure that the muscle's long enough to get into, or the needle is long enough to get into their muscle. We would typically wanna use an 18 to 27 gauge. Administration sites is where there is muscle. The most common that we would use would be the deltoid, but we can also use the vastus lateralis, the ventral gluteal, or the dorsal gluteal. They do recommend that we don't use the dorsal gluteal anymore because that's where the sciatic nerve runs, and it's very common to accidentally nick the sciatic nerve. The angle that we use for intramuscular injections is 90 degrees. The different ways that we can administer it is you would want to either pull the skin taunt or use the Z-Track method. In the Z-Track method, we actually move the top layer of the skin, inject the medication into the muscle, and then move that layer of the skin back. And what this does is it prevents the medication from leaking into the skin and causing irritation. Common examples of medications we would in administer intramuscularly are medications for pain, vitamins, vaccines, and some psychiatric medications. Then we have intravenous medications. Intravenous are a benefit because we can administer large amounts of fluid at once. Typically, we're going to insert a catheter and connect that to tubing. The catheter can be anywhere from 18 to 22 gauge. And like I said, the catheter size is going to de be dependent on what we can administer. For blood administration, we have to have an 18 to 20 gauge catheter size. We can have a catheter that's inserted either centrally or peripherally. Centrally means that the medication has a long catheter that goes directly into the upper chamber of the heart. We call this a central line, and it can be either a pick or a port. The pictures on the right, the top picture is a port, so you have the line, you can see how it goes into the heart, and then there's a little device that sits underneath the skin. We can access that device by putting a needle into the port, and you can see that in the right part of that picture. Whereas a pick line, it has a catheter at the end with lure locks. And that's um, something that can have either one, two, or three ports. This is beneficial because we can administer multiple medications at once through the PICC line. The PICC line, because it is so close to the heart, requires different medication administration processes, and it requires increased sterility, but the benefit is that you can use them more long-term. The other type of <laughs> IVs that we have are peripheral. And this goes into the forearm, the antecubital faucet, or the hand. Some people do need it to be placed in the foot or the head based on the permeability and the ability to get a catheter into their veins. But if we do put it in the foot or the head, we often need an order from a provider. Examples of things we can give intravenous are going to be things like blood, antibiotics, food replacement, chemotherapy, IV medications, vitamins, pain medications, and a lot of other medications. The benefit to it is that it can administer large amounts of medication quickly and it has quicker absorption. The risks is because it has such a quick absorption that we have high risk for toxicity and adverse events. It is much more expensive and can be an um, inconvenient, especially if they're connected to tubing and the patient is mobile, they would then have to carry the IV pole everywhere. And there's an increased risk for infection. Lastly, we have epidural medications, and these are used to administer IV op opioid analgesia. The catheter is inserted into the epidural space with the use of a large bore needle. This is often placed in between the fourth and fifth vertebra. Then it's connected to either an infusion pump or the medication is inserted directly. You do have to be certified to administer epidural medication because it is a high risk medication. It does need to be a sterile procedure and the risks is that it can cause nerve damage, infection or loss of cerebral fl spinal fluid. Then we have GI administration. So this is done through either a nasogastric or a gastrostomy tube. With a nasogastric tube, the tubing goes through the nair down to the stomach. Um, in order to insert it, we have to consider a couple of different things. One, is the nose patent? And two, do they have a deviated septum? Like I said, the tubing sits in the stomach, so we need to verify that it's in the correct spot before we give any medications through it. 
And there's different ways that you can do that. You can measure the gastric um, juices where it's sitting at to see if it matches that of the stomach. But the best method of verification is going to be an x-ray. If they are connected to suction through the NG tube and we are administering medications, we would wanna stop the suctioning, give the medication, and then wait for 30 minutes before turning the suction back on. The process to giving medications through a nasogastric tube is to prepare the medications. Typically, we try to use medications that are already in liquid form. If they're not, we need to crush the medications and make them, mix them with sterile water. Um, in order to do that, we need to make sure that the medication is something that can be crushed. Then we would flush the tube with 30 mLs, administer the medication, and then flush with 30 more mLs. Considerations when giving medications through a nasogastric tube is that if we have multiple medications, they should be given individually with 15 mLs administered in between. We have to consider if it's able to be crushed and an NG tube is more of a short-term solution. Whereas a gastrostomy tube is a little bit more long-term and there's two different types. There's a G tube, which goes into the stomach and a J tube, which goes into the intestines. The process of administering medications is the exact same that we would do with an NG tube. Different considerations that we have though, is if they're receiving tube feedings, um, we need to check their residuals, which means how much of that tube feeding is sitting in the stomach and intestines that's not getting absorbed. And we would have to stop the tube feeding to administer the medications. We can resume the tube feeding right away after the medications are given. Another thing that we need to consider is assessing the site. Um, I have ostomy there, but it wouldn't be an ostomy, it would just be an insertion site. So you would wanna assess that, make sure that there's no risk for infection, make sure that the tubing's not dislodged or anything. And that is our mini number two.